or campaigner and I think that's wrong I think you need the data and as we mm. said it's not glamorous like I get it people have jumped on now because of the incident which they're entitled to do because everyone's entry into 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 activism is different right fair enough but at the same time those of us who have been here for a while or have that sort of like strategic oversight we need to make sure that we don't we don't we don't upset ourselves with what's going on in that side. Right. But we have to think about, you join with people who understand it to your degree. Not to say we don't understand it more, but in a different way, right? Because mm. we can't do what they're doing. A lot of them are more strategic in their way. And I can't, I can't protest the way some people protest. They're very good at it. But I think it's for us not to be like, well, you're not doing it right. Okay, cool. But move on to the people that understand you and make a strategic way. Because yeah. it's, at, at the end yeah. of the people are going to look to us. They're going to say, we've been in this for 10 years. And what have you done? And they're going to be like, yeah. well, if I do my way. So we all have to look at, who are we engaged with? There's no point someone who's been in it for 10 years talking to someone who's been in it for one year and acting like to say, I can compare myself. No. I just think yeah. strategically, think join up everyone mm. who, who who has an oversight and make it work. And I yeah. think, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. On the point about statistics, um, I know Black Ballad have been working really hard at trying to compile statistics for us in the UK. So I know they did a, a survey where they were talking to Black British women about their experiences um, with maternal care and childbirth and that yeah. kind of thing. And I know they're doing some additional things along those lines um, just to get that data. Um, but in just in terms of like, um, cause I wanted to call, give my two cents on the agenda as it were. I think cause of me, what I do professionally, I'm very much in favor of having like a structure being clear about what the purpose is, what the agenda is, what the objective is. I, I absolutely appreciate that that is, doesn't always translate well with, you know, we're protesting and that is concerned. But for me, when I was thinking about what would a black agenda look like in regards to black, black, black British people in the UK, and I tried to think of some universal areas that I thought we all are affected by, no matter whether you're in Birmingham or whether you're in London. And the three that I came up with was education, healthcare, and um, the Met Police, or the police force. Um, for me, I think education is extremely important. And as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, there is a lack of education or a whitewashing of history that contributes, I think, to some of the sentiments that maybe white people have in this country about themselves or about black people. Um, healthcare is another one. Um, I mean, any woman that's had a child, I know you, Rose, um, you've spoken quite openly about your experiences and you had Tiffany, and that, that contributes to, I mean, look, look at COVID, for example, we are disproportionately affected by COVID, and there are so many different reasons for that. Um, I think where it concerns having some sort of like organizational structure or whatever, again, not to be overly critical, but I do feel like a lot of people just want to be the face and, mm -hmm. and not necessarily- the money. Yeah, I'm not necessarily caring about the actual issue. It's more about, I want to be the one to bring this forward rather than saying, do you know what? Because even when we look in, even if we look throughout history and we, everyone always talks about Martin Luther King, everyone always talks about Malcolm X. There were many men behind these men who, we, who history will never remember, unfortunately, but they are the ones who really helped to mobilize, strategize, write their speeches, do the, the work on the ground, but we always will remember Martin Luther King because Martin, Martin Luther King was an excellent orator. He was excellent at speaking. That was his gift, right? That was his gift. But then there are people in his camp who can't do stuff like that. They can't go in front of a crowd and speak openly. So what I see is that people need to really recognize where they basically recognize your place. But I thought yeah, like but that's where media, strength is. Ooh. But social media gives us all a platform. Like, no matter who you are, social media gives everyone a platform. And that's the difference between maybe now and like 20, 30, 40 years ago when people were protesting, is that social media gives every single person a voice, gives us all a platform. So we're all kind of little mini activists and that's fine. But if we were going to sort of come together and pull all our resources together, I think there needs to be some hard conversations about who represents us. Because at the moment, the people that are the ones sitting on the BBC, like you know, no disrespect. <laughs> I'm sorry. What are you saying? But you, I mean, but like, this is a, this is the thing about respect like, of the people, you, guys. This is the thing about like, us. You've got like you, okay, perfect example. I mean, I don't want to say her name. I'm not trying to give her any more, you know, air. Oh, don't start. But you know, you you have certain sort of black conservatives that are the loudest, and they're the ones that are constantly being called by you know mainstream to speak on behalf of us. And I'm not necessarily saying we do need a spokesperson, but I think it's dangerous when particular people are given platforms. But we know why, right? 
So you know why they've been yeah, giving us you know that. Tools. But, 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 and but, I think but, that. Go on. Go on. Sorry, I was saying, I think that speaks to the whole conversation that we're having. And people aren't applying discernment around, you know, what, what they're ingesting and how they kind of understand things. We've all spoken about a collective agenda, but you've also spoken about black conservatives who have a particular um, standpoint. Then I've seen people like, oh, I don't rate Black Lives Matter because they're, they want to kill the black family and they're inclusive of LGBT people, et cetera, et cetera. And they don't care about men. So when we're talking about the movement and moving forwards, we've actually spoken about why this is all so complicated and why forming an agenda is so complicated. And people talk quite often about we need leaders, we need leaders. It's impossible to have a leader and for them not to apply their own narrative over things. And we've seen that. I mean, um, Basaya spoke about the romanticization of things. The civil rights movement was romanticized. When you look at where the civil rights started, it was Han and Renaissance, and a lot of it was leaded by LGBT people. But then when the, you know, the church became involved and the kind of church of the 60s, yeah. those people were moved out because that it was seen as a sin. So exactly. So when we start talking about agendas and we need to have focus, I agree 100%. But we need to understand there are a number, diff- number of different identities that intersect with blackness. Yeah. And all of them are as equally as important. So when yes. we're trying to have a collective focus, everyone's going to be forcing their narratives. And the problem is, is what you're focused on is going to come out. What yeah. you're against is going to come out as well. And yeah. what you're against is going to come out strongly. And what you're going to find is if you have particular leaders, and there are people out here that lots and lots and lots of people rate, but actually they're misogynists, they're homophobes, and they have certain ideologies, and it's very obvious when they start talking and you can hear it. But because they're That's such passionate... Well, exactly. But then we have them in our own here, Britain, UK. But I'm not trying to get mixed up right now. You know what I mean? But we have them here in our UK. But yeah. what happens is, like you said, because they're such great orators, everyone's like, yeah, what you're saying is amazing, blah, blah, blah. But then when you start to unpick the mm. things that are being said, you're yeah. like, like, this is, a, this is a, essentially what you're trying to be is an oppressive white man or an oppressive white woman. That's, That's what you're trying to be. You're yeah. saying that my type of blackness is the only type of blackness that counts. So, and anyone else outside of that, I don't care about them. I think that that really boggles my mind when we say Black Lives Matter. Oh wait, no, but except you, like it's I don't. I don't no. I honestly, I just. And this I is why, and, and this is why I don't want one person to represent me. I mean, um, yeah. just like going going back to what we said earlier about like skill sets and things. For me, it's just like play a position and stay there. And when you're ready to level up, do it. But until then, play your position. And if it means keeping quiet, be quiet and do what. And there's nothing wrong with that as well. And that's it. And then when it comes to I leadership, think- like I said, I don't want one person to represent me because I am a very complex, a multifaceted person. And it, it isn't just about me, it's about everyone else that makes yeah. up this community. Yeah. I, mean, I think, there I think are, there's there going to be black, different. Sorry, Ted, but there are, um, there are black leaders and experts outside of the government within their own specific fields you know we've got black teachers we've got black healthcare workers we've got black scholars black social workers black trade union members black people working in pr and marketing black lawyers there are there are so many uh, black experts within all the different industries that make up the society that we navigate in i think it's important that we instead of creating this one face or this one leader we have uh, we have multiple people leading in their expert fields to talk about specific topics so if someone on question t- so if we've got a debate on question time and someone's talking about education we get someone that is heavily that is heavily vested within the education system that has experience in the education system as a teacher as a head teacher and they are the people or a group of people like them they are the ones that speak on issues of education and black people within the education system the same thing with healthcare there are plenty of ex- experts doctors um uh, head of departments that work in the nhs they are the people that we speak to that are willing to go onto these uh, tv shows to but talk they don't about call those people though but that's the thing if we if we have if we go back to Black Lives Matter, yeah. if the organisation is structured in that way, then media mainstream platforms will then come to us to look for our expertise because we are actually showcasing them. They're not. We're, we're not showcasing I, the experts. I, mean, I was thinking, but of, there are also 
I was thinking of a specific person when you said education, because there is a woman that, that 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 typically gets called to speak when it comes. But to we need more than one energy. person. I know, that's but that's the problem. We need. We need. Like um, guys, we're well. talking on a we're also, talking on a performance level. We're talking on a performance level. A lot of the time, these people are the face. They are specialists in each field that represent certain initiatives. I know, Richie, you represent certain initiatives in your organisation for certain agenda for a certain agenda, but you just won't know all the time who they are but when it comes to mainstream media that's where you know the respect isn't there for the black community to say okay instead of speaking to x about the black issue let's speak to people that are actually well versed in police brutality in in um financial oppression in um domestic violence these sort of things that affect black people in the uk do you see what i'm saying i agree yes, about because these people agree. are yes. working they are working Sorry, Richie, then Vasaya. There's no, there's just a quick comment that I wanted to make. I, I don't want to take Vasaya's time because I know she's coming with fire, okay. but like, I, no, I feel like no, we need no. to acknowledge the fact that there are um, there are also black people in the hood just trying to survive, and they have a part in this conversation as well. And I think that like, when we start talking about this, we start talking about yeah, people in this position, that position, this position, that position, and it all gets very middle class. The conversation, you know, and it all gets very privileged and. But when we're having these conversations, mm -hmm. it's really important that we consider that there is a large chunk of our community that are surviving. Yeah. It's survival for them. And they yeah. deserve a place and a seat at the table as well. And it's important that people make room for those people because then what it ends up becoming is this black excellence. And this is what excellence is. And we have all the best people. And obviously there's a space for that. But mm -hmm. I always try and get people to understand like, there, there are also people out here surviving and they want to do things as well. And they, mm -hmm. they are dis more disproportionately affected than a lot of people. I have lots mm -hmm. of privileges and I grew up in the hood, but I have lots of privileges now that I didn't have back then. And there are people in a position that I was in back then. And it's important that their voices are amplified as well. And we, yeah. uh, we don't just look to people who have privilege or in positions of power or authority. Does that make sense? No, yeah. That's a good point. Thanks for raising that. Really good point. Because I 100%. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, like, something similar, actually. It, it's, that's why we need to work in different spheres. Like, and no sphere is better than another sphere. It's just the sphere of your influence. So this is why, when it comes to policy, people who operate in that sphere are going to know how to navigate. And people from the ends are going to be best placed to navigate the ends or understand what the issues are. At least if they're Definitely. not going to transform it into policy, they're going to be the ones that say, this is why you get that conversation about expertise and elitism, right? Elitism is when you only value people who operate at a certain level of society. But expertise yeah. recognises that proximity to that issue means you're the expert. Hence why Absolutely. I always believe like, you know, social workers should be, should, be, should be experts in education because their proximity to the people we're talking to. So I think that's one of the issues we need to focus on is the expertise and elitism differentiation. I also believe that we as a, and I feel like, a lot, I know a lot of the conversation is generally about racism, about obviously white and black, just for the sake of this conversation. But as, as we said earlier, in terms of how we have to accelerate our learning, the issue is we think because we are oppressed that we are automatically prepared and resourced and knowledgeable in our oppression and therefore have to change mm. things. That's the issue we have. And no one wants to talk about the fact that you can be oppressed and also project, but you can be oppressed and also be conditioned. So one of the issues is people feel like, because I've experienced racism, I'm going to shout, 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 shout. But yes, we agree with your space, you have to shout, but you still have to transform it into the solutions to a certain degree. So I think, and obviously we talk a lot about campaigning and there's been a lot of people hijack the, hijack the movement. So of course we're going to be skeptical about elitism and all that middle class stuff. But I do believe as we said, the reality of things is that there are going to be certain people who, who need to do it, right, in a particular way to push it forward. And we can't, we're not, we shouldn't, we shouldn't see that as an ego thing of like, oh, why they get to not me? But it has to be a thing of, there are certain people who are going to have to push it forward. Do you know what I'm saying? And the last thing I want to say about um, this conversation is that you kind of see on Twitter as well is the fact that um, it's our fault as well. Like, obviously, white people have their agenda. They're always going to have their agenda. So to me, whatever they do, don't surprise me. But it's us as well. We've propped up so many people. And we didn't have the boundaries. We didn't say, this is where we feel like you're going to be in this particular thing. Like, for example, if you're a good rapper, I think rappers have great influence. But I think people then assume that because you're a rapper, therefore you're going to be disposed to every seat you sit on, you're going to talk about things. I love Stormzy, do you get me? I think he's great. But at the same time, what happens is that you give the guy so much pressure to do so much in a space yeah. that he might not be experienced in. Just because yeah. we, as a people, we've been sedated so much with about the entertainment industry, that only entertainment is logic. You know why? Because we aspire to a lifestyle. So we're going to apply all logic and grace and everything onto you. But the issue is now, we've got all these people from said women who are on these platforms who we don't really rate. They come from a platform that most of the time is just about controversy. controversy. We didn't regulate that, those things, but the people that were doing great work, for example, let's say someone like Richie doing great work, 
unless Richie was doing something with his top off or doing something crazy, we might not nominate him. Do you know? We might not give him all the views he needs because he's not doing something that is entertaining yeah. in the same way. Yeah, we spoke so about it. Well, we need to look at it. And, and the only reason why now we're all struggling is because outside of Black Lives Matter, we didn't see the urgency in having people with integrity to represent us. We thought it's just fun. And I get it because our lives are so tech, like stressful that we need entertainment. That's how we survive, by laughing it off and enjoying. Yeah, but at the same time now, when it's time to get things cracking, we're looking around going, oh my God, we haven't got a leader. Who but we it? have all these yeah. influences with 20K people. So for me personally, I feel like there's work in the community we need to do. And we shouldn't shy away from telling our community that, guys, we need to pattern as well. Because if a white person even came today with 50 billion and said, what do we need to do? A lot of us would be like, um, um, well, um, all I knew no was that racism, which is no fine. Yeah. But fam, yeah. but fam, like, really honestly, yeah. there's time to play and there's time to be serious. And, they, and people think that those of us who do activism, we don't like playing. Listen, I'll, I'm the, I'll turn up with anyone. But there's a time and a place for it as well because yeah. now we have to ask some questions. People now want to look at us and be like, "What's your answers?" But when when there was no protest, everyone was speaking. All you do is talk about race and stuff. So I feel like as a community, yo, social justice warrior. Social justice, yeah. Warrior, but now everyone's looking to people about what is sexual consent. When I was telling you, exactly. you might was saying it's not that deep. Now everyone's asking for the definition. Please, 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 please pay me for my time. But most, <laughs> what we have to do is basically the same. Do you know what I mean? On all serious note. You have to have humility, whether you joined the movement now or you've always been in it, to know there's always things to learn. Yeah. And and you also and being to accountable you as, well. as well. Yeah, I think I mean we spoke about this um uh, like a, a while ago on performative activism and everything that you mentioned we touched on in there that you know we just we we propel people into positions that they're not prepared for or they they, they don't need to be in just because a lot of the time in different uh, industries we we have that one and we look to that one to be the spokesperson like to be the face of the race when they were never meant to be that person to begin with and then we get disappointed when they don't say what we want them to say or they don't say how we want them to say it or they don't tweet enough or they don't give enough or and and we just have these unrealistic expectations placed on people that just weren't meant to be there to begin with something you said just now that I really want to touch on because we're going to start wrapping up soon is you said please pay me for my time that's something that's also come up with regards to activism about whether activism should pay now what I said earlier is that I feel like because a lot of us all have social media platforms, whether it's Twitter platform or Instagram or a YouTube channel, everyone has a platform. And now everyone is using that platform, whether it is to amplify somebody else, whether it is to bring awareness to what's going on. Um, but then but a lot of us also have full time jobs. So my livelihood isn't dependent on how many tweets I tweet or, you know, me going to speak at a school. Like, I'm still going to get paid regardless. What I'm doing is just because I feel like I'm moved to do it, right? So the conversation about whether activists should be paid for their work comes up all the time. And again, on the timeline, there was another bit of controversy about that where people were just sort of like, well, you know, why should they be paid? Who should pay? And I just wanted to get you guys' thoughts on what you feel about activists and them being paid for their work. I think Why most of should the time, somebody? Surprise. Sorry, especially. Sorry. No, no, no. Like, uh, go on. But, 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 uh, I'll go. I'll on, just so. be very. Quick. I think. Mo I think most of the time, people will be surprised that most activists don't even ask to be paid. You know, it's when they get to the point of exhaustion that they that they say, you know what? Just for some sort of a remun remuneration. Most of the time, most activists, as you said, Tobey, like you'll feel moved. By the time I feel moved, I'm not going to think about how much peace I'm going to get. You most likely Fact. do the job first, and then just say, "Is anyone going to be money?" There's never been a time where you withhold your labor. Unless it's a big organization, a big, like, you know, captain's organization that's saying to you, do this work for me to better my organization so I look good and I want your labor. For me personally, if an organization approaches me and says, I want you to do so certain things for me and they expect to do it for free, then you should pay me. Do you know why? Because I'm helping your organization. This is strategy work at the end of the day. Race is an intellectual discipline that it does require rigor anyway and resources and time. And I know that you work on labor divided by time and money so i know that's your that's your calculation so i'm gonna apply that to you <laughs> but in elsewhere do you know i mean that's that's your word but elsewhere i'm not gonna tell an old lady that oh pay me for this kind of stuff because at the end of the day i know that's not how she's even looking at the support i'm giving Same. her so it's about using that um um what you call it the equations or whatever calculations uh, according to the in, uh, to the institution but i do feel like it's because many people don't know what activism is can only assume we're just shouting from our bedrooms 
basic things. And I think that's the assumption is that activism isn't a real job. And you know why? Because racism isn't a real struggle. I think that's the only way I could really understand why you say that. Don't get me wrong. Everyone has the ability to say something, act like to say something that's quite activisty. So I think people are like, if I can say this with one tweet and I don't need to fed, why do you need to do that? Which is fair. But at the same yeah. time, a lot of us work behind the scenes. A lot of us aren't, most of the work we do isn't online. Like we've probably done 50 odd jobs before we even came to the net to tell you what we've done. And I think this up for me. I just think it's, it's a lack of understanding what activism is. And um, it's just it's just one of those things that when it comes to money, people are always very skeptical about why are you getting paid for that? People don't like to get paid, but I would argue, use the same energy on people in different industries. Do you know what I mean? Who are getting paid to do stuff that don't actually move our community forward in the same way. So mm -hmm. that's just my thing on it. I okay. just want to echo what you're saying because I completely agree with you. And my mm -hmm. approach has always been this. Why shouldn't, why shouldn't those people get paid? Like it's pretty much that simple. Like for me, the, 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 when I started working in my community at 16, I didn't get paid. I did that same voluntary job for 10 years and I didn't get paid. At one point in my life, I was unemployed. And I was going to that place even more, not getting paid. And I was happy to do it. My whole thing is this. If people are out here doing the work that directly affects or changes my life for the positive, I, I, I'm more than happy to see those people get money. I give 10% of my salary. I'm privileged enough to do that. I give 10% of my salary to charities or GoFundMes or, you know, people in the community that need money. I, I do that a month. 10% a month. I have no issues with these people getting money whatsoever. I feel like money is a really difficult conversation. And activism, it's emotionally laborious. Um, besides talk about spoke about people getting burnt out, it is resource heavy, um, it is difficult, and it can sometimes dismantle your life. Like it has an effect on your home life, it has an effect on the way that you see yourself, it has an effect with the relationship with your community. You can become a target as a result. Um, you're constantly offering up emotional labor because race is an emotive subject for yeah. us as black people. You know, mm -hmm. so when I see people doing the work out here, I'm more, especially black women, you know, when we talk, talk about the socioeconomic disparity and, you know, how black women are affected, I am more than happy to give my money and for them to get money, more than happy. Do you think, so I'll, I'll ask this question to you, Rose. Um, do you think um, with the topic of, being paid do you think if you are do you think it can compromise your work if money sort of becomes the driving factor to the activism I don't think that money will become the driving factor I think that the reason why people question or even bring it as a topic that should activists get paid um being someone that's not an activist right I feel like the reason that people like me on the outside, I don't have an issue with it, but I feel like the reason that people would is because in their mind, the people that are activists are these ones that are doing social justice warrior on Twitter and Instagram and screaming about it. They see those people as activists. Now, some of these people that we see online are activists. Like for example, I see people like Busayo and Richie online and I share what they are sharing because I don't have the words or the information for myself. But people assume that everyone that is screaming and making noise online are the activists. So they assume, well, if I bang out a few tweets and create a few cute posts on Instagram, then I'm an activist too. Why don't I get paid? But mm. those are, like I said, those are not the activists. Um, some of them are, and you see them online, but not everyone is. Like Tiffany was mentioning, the grassroots initiatives, not everyone that we're seeing is an activist. So those people that are actually doing the work behind the scenes, like Bussaya said, that you've done 50 things offline before you even showed your face online in a tweet or in a post, those are the people that deserve to get paid. They have bills, they got families, they need to eat, they need to keep a roof over their head. Why the hell not? Are they not helping you? Are they not doing it for you? Sometimes who would you, who would you propose? Who would you propose? People that are doing this work, I, I don't see why we shouldn't be the ones to pay them. I don't it's see our, it's our give issue. me a justified our reason we why we should money. Because when stuff is going, you know, when shit's going south, like how things are now, like, you know, now it's been thrust into the spotlight that the things that black people are going through, is it not these same people that we're running to? So, okay, what do we do? What happens next? Where do we go? Who do we talk to? Is it not these same people that we're coming to and we'll be dragging for filth if they don't get up at, at our demand to tell us what's next? So why shouldn't it be us? No one can give me a justified reason why we shouldn't be the ones to keep them up there. Because if it's not us, who's going to do it? Who's going to pay them? Who's going to look after them? Do you know what I also think the issue is, though, is that it's not necessarily... Because I get what you're saying, that people think that it's influencers that mm -hmm. are activists. I think people sort of conflate, like, 
influencers and activists and they think well you're getting all these brand deals why do you need but it's not even just that I feel like sometimes people look at activists like the DeRays and like the what's that other guy the one who Who's black or white? Sean Riley. Sean King. Sean King. Sean King. Sean King. Oh, I was like Sean King. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Is he? Is he black? I don't know. I, don't. But I think he's mixed race. He's okay, fine. Mixed. So people look at people like that who have seemed to have made it into some sort of lucrative career. Yeah. And who get, are American? Who are American? Yeah. Um, and kind of become uncomfortable with you know the the lucrative nature of their work. Um, and I think that's more so where some people kind of get a bit uncomfortable with activism and that. And also almost as if like the work they're doing becomes compromised because they're now so, they're bound to all these brands and bound to all these corporations that it's like, it's almost like it dilutes the purity mm. of activism. But top of it, when we, it, need, when to, it takes we need to stop them. conflating the UK experience with the US experience because yeah. economically it's completely different. And the way black Britishness is set up is completely different to the way that, you know, black, you, you know, African-Americans are set up and the economy is completely different. So when we're talking about the lucrative nature of activism in the US, it's not the same here. Any activism that I've done, I haven't been paid for, never. I get paid for, you know, like, like panel events, all of that kind of stuff. I get paid for that. But I, and I wouldn't even call myself an activist. I'm somebody who's been involved in activism. I haven't been paid for activism. I haven't. Yeah. I mean, They're personally, my, my, my personal view, just to throw it out there, is that I do feel like your time should be compensated for, personally. That is my view, especially if you're... Like, for example, the other day, my sister is trying to work on Black History Month for her company, mm. and they've asked her for um, suggestions these people are going to come in and speak about race and all the different things. They should be compensated. For Pay them. So I personally yeah. feel that they should be. Um, so that's my personal view, just in case anyone was confused about what I think it, I Can think I just say, because I feel like I keep talking. Sorry, Demetrius, just one point. Go just, for it, go for it. <laughs> like, there, no, sorry, there's, there's different types of activism. So mm -hmm. what, and it's just to build on what Demetrius said a bit earlier, Ron, and he spoke about grassroots work. So there are panel events, there, there's coming into organisations and there's giving speeches, there's creating stuff within your community, there's doing Intrigue. stuff online. When we think, mm -hmm. at, yeah, when we think, even this, having conversations like this on Black Canvas TV is a form of activism. You are raising the consciousness of people and you're having a conversation. So when we're talking about activism, it's important that we don't conflate everything. There are specific types of activism that people do. Demetrius, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to... No, that's that all right. Point. That's fine. Because I just wanted to I'd loop on to the fact that it's, it's about value as well and where we place value in the people who are, who are, well, activists as well. So if, if you're on the grassroots, does society, do we actually value those people on the grassroots? And if we value them, why shouldn't we part money for their work? Their work is helping us, no? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like you, you give 10%, Richie, you give 10% of your salary. Like I know, mm. I know I give to charities and I give to individuals who are doing their part. So it's all about if we, if we valued activism and activists as much as we say we do, then the question of should activism pay should, wouldn't be a question really. That's a good point. A good there'll, point. Be money also, in yeah. there'll be money in their pocket for them to do the work that they need to do. I was, and also for me, I just feel like there, these are the things that I know I can't do. I'm not, exactly. I'm under no illusion. I know <laughs> I, there are some things I know I can't do, but my money, <laughs> very happy to give it's it to hand, me. Can you. I can't do that. There are organisations that I've supported, like the Reach Out is, we always use as an example, but Black Canvas has supported the Reach Out project because I feel like what they're doing is amazing. And I know personally, I don't, I can't do that. I don't have the time to do that, but those people do. So that's how I support. So you're, so you're right about value because I value the work that they're doing, but I fully know that I can't do that. So I use whatever resource I have to amplify and to support them. And I think a lot of us should be doing, could be doing more of that. Who had a point? I, I think or, me. Oh, anyway. hi. Um, um, I was going to say it's it's about community, the community aspect. If we we're trying to get to a point where we're more autonomous as a community, we should be plugging our money into that community. So that that is activism as well. And I don't think I think there's a lot of pressure around the title or the label of activism. Like um, Rich was saying, he doesn't identify as an activist, but he is in, very much involved in activist. Um, initiatives so um yeah like there's different things that everyone can do 
that is activism um, and just being confident in that. And also I wanted to plug um, this new, well, something I newly joined, it's called Kwanda. And basically they work with current initiatives for different projects. Um, they work with Michael, who we worked, for, worked with before, who's a therapist who has group sessions and he um, shares that skill. And then they've worked with Guap Mag as well. Um, uh, with some initiatives back in Africa. So there's, you can see where your money, cause you contribute monthly. So you can see where your money is going for different things that you contribute to. So yeah. I really like that initiative. So Kwanda, Kwanda. Amazing. Um, um, but yeah, I was just saying that like, yeah, there's different types of activism. Everyone has different skills and input. And um, yeah, you know, we need to plug the money back into these people so that they're respected. And there's actual consequences for um, things being dealt with um on the macro level thank you yeah i think what undermines sometimes what undermines the activism though is linked to like being paid is the fact that it's the it's the cliqueiness that comes about after that so then people start thinking we're just sponsoring a lifestyle and not I'm about i'm not talking about um upkeep but i'm saying sometimes you do see people that start off with activism and then they get certain brands and it's the same types of people over and over again that get the platform so even if i think what they're doing is great it's like there's a certain type of activism that we like and if it's not the shouting you are racist i hate you we don't we don't think it's activism do you know what i'm saying so i think again i only look back at our community because i feel like it's easier to change within than to kind of look outside sometimes but Again, I do think there's a blame in us as well. Like activists end up at the same parties that certain people go to, or they end up in the same the same pictures and the same things over and over again. And it almost looks like you can't sit with us. So I feel like from the outside, I definitely understand that. Because even me, I wouldn't consider myself part of those kind of cliques, you know what I mean? But then some people could say I was, but I just think sometimes it's the fact that like, I don't know, it's the fact that what happens is, don't forget, regardless if you're activists or not, we're on the same social media platforms. And social media itself begets a certain type of atmosphere and personality type that even if you don't think you're playing to it, it does yeah. it. It doesn't care whatever your job is. So if you're going to engage with certain people or go to those type of events and say those type of things, and also we talk about glamorization, the glamorous types of projects again and again and again. It's like if I'm if I interview uh, if I interview a rapper, all of a sudden I'm going to be seen as the girl who's the most activist out here. But if I interview an old man who's gardening, he's been gardening for hundred years, like there's fifty years in Brixton, no one's going to come to my page and be like, oh, what you're doing is interesting. Do you know what I'm saying? So I think with us as well, we associate glamour, we associate activism with certain types of endeavors, and that determines that we want to help you. And I do think, don't get me wrong, I think police brutality is a disgusting thing that we're all going through. But I do think, again, it's the easiest conversation to have with black people for them to be like, I like what you're doing because it's about, it's about murder. It's very much like, you know, sensationalized. But if it's something to do with like childbirth, it's, you have to, first of all, be, almost be a woman to really care in yeah. that degree. You to have care to, so for me, again, I do yeah. feel like we yeah. haven't developed yeah. an appetite. We haven't really developed an appetite for all different types of struggles. And I think this is what everyone was saying about the intersection of our community. If it's not about, you know, something that affects maybe a black man in some sort of violent encounter, we, we, we swear we don't care. But if it happened to our parents, like, and again, there's, there's, I do think there's a bit of ageism as well. There's so many people who are like over 50 who have been doing this for a time, but because they haven't got a social media platform and they, and they can't look like, you know, they yeah. can't have drip on the timeline, we don't care. We only care about those people who are gonna be on BBC because it gives them engagement. So Such I feel like, again, we, we do need to look at ourselves and go, oh my, we are perpetuating it because we only yeah. listen to things that look good. Do you know what I mean? We only, yeah. we only associate ourselves with things that make us look like, say, the part of the it crowd. And that's where we fall short, in my opinion. And that's why BBC has the audacity to even ask certain people to talk. If they knew Absolutely. the truth, they would never, they would Absolutely. never. And we would yeah. also block them, but we don't because we, we like controversy and we like- We love it. You know I mean? we, we love, love it. We love it, love it. We love it. Honestly, gagging for it. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, sorry, guys. Richie, you want to say something, gonna Richie? To We're going to have to start rounding up. Um, <laughs> We're gonna, Rose. Did you want to say something before we just round out? Um, just, uh, when, you, when you mentioned, when Busayo mentioned like the um, motherhood side of it and childbirth, it it just brought me back because I had so much frustration last year when the Embrace report came out. Um, the one back in 2018, I believe, is the one that was released. And that was where we found out that black mothers are five times more likely to die in childbirth than white women, white mothers, and that black children have a 121% increased risk of stillbirth in their, um, not stillbirth, of dying in their first 28 days of life. I was so riled up. I was fuming. And every day I was pumping it out on, on I wasn't really active on Twitter at the time, I was really pumping out on social media, on Instagram, that please sign a petition, tell your friends to sign a petition, tell your mom, your auntie, whoever, just get them to sign their name. And 
collectively the people that were promoting it had something crazy like eight mil like the the, the reach was about eight million people but the signature only garnered thirty thousand signatures and i was like what the fuck is this because mm. this is this is your sister your auntie your cousin these people are dying like i know they what i even they shouldn't even need to think about it you shouldn't even have to question it just sign the thing you don't yeah, want your sister, your auntie, your cousin to die. You don't want your, your, your family member to go through nine months of pregnancy, labor, and then the child to just die for racism. Sign but if it's, de- but if it's defund, it. if it's defund police, and don't get me wrong, I'm for that, but can you say if it's defund the police? It's because oh, you know, we have that no relationship with the police that it's easy to say defund the police because we oh, know that it's... no one's going to chat to you if you say defund the police. But if I have to make you think about it and go, can we also look at the healthcare system? People are going to be like, um, well, oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, yeah. And you've only gone to 30,000 signatures. And I was so angry because I was like, what part of this doesn't click in your head that I, this is something I need to champion? Mm-hmm. But it's only now, during this whole huge resurgence of Black Lives Matter, that the, because they had the, you had six months to sign the petition and it only got 30,000 signatures and then the response that they gave us was complete trash anyway and they gave us another one which is again complete trash but now during the three surges there's a platform called I think five times more something like that and they're they're campaigning for this um, black maternal motherhood that now they put another government petition and that went over 100,000 signatures and that has to be debated yeah, it's yeah, only yeah, because yeah. of this yeah. resurgence that now people are like oh okay I'll sign it and I, I remember thinking why wouldn't you sign it what would make you not want to sign it? Because this is something so obvious and so easy that could, and it's only because of racism. Like, why wouldn't you? And I couldn't yeah. understand. And it's exactly what she's saying about it being sensation. It's something easy to tie to. I never watched a video, but it's very easy to say, oh, I don't ever want to see that. And then sign. But why is it for other situations? People are like, hmm, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, there's a there's a lot there's the a, new I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you brought that to the forefront. Um there is a there is a lot, a lot to like to to address and you guys have really given some great points to think about, especially with regards to you know, not focusing on a particular type of like black person in the sort of like, you know, the the palatable, you know, black person, the middle class, the the educated. Let's not forget those maybe who have also who have been to prison and now come out and just want to rebuild their lives. Do you know what I mean? Like there is so many of of us and I think sometimes we can fall into you know unfortunately can fall into that look and it's about all of us sometimes we do forget that there is an intersectionality where it comes to black people that just because that issue may not directly affect you doesn't mean that I'm not going to support that for example we've got Ro and Tanya Compass who've done great things for the LGBT community I'm not part of that community but I'll still support it because I know that these are black people. Do you know what I mean? That they, they, they need therapy. They need these binders. They need these things. Some of them are homeless. And I think sometimes we can become so like, you know, have that tunnel vision, that literally just being concerned about what affects you. And I think as a community, we need to widen that scope and actually say all black lives do matter, not just the black life that, you know, you think is important. Um, I mean, we could go on and talk about this for a really long time, but we do have to wrap up. And I just want to thank you guys for you know setting up your computers in the comfort of your home thank you so much <laughs> uh, um i really really appreciate it and um for you guys that are watching this at home um what we're going to do is that we are going to plug some of the grassroots organizations that we spoke about in this episode because they're doing some amazing work and not that they ask us or they ask for this attention but i just think it's important to plug them and give them that support because the government isn't doing it but i think for the first time in a really long time i've seen us really come together and support each other so what we'll do in the description box is that we'll leave some grassroots organizations that you can support there are tons of petitions out there the ones that come to mind we'll also put them down there just sign it just take anything away from you um but yeah as always thank you so much for watching um, i want to know what you guys think as well like you know what is your idea of um black liberation like have you marched have you protested what would you like to see happen let's continue the conversation let's not let black lives matter just be another hashtag like it's a way of life um so thank you guys so much for watching and we will see you in our next video take care bye